So for the members seminar today, uh, I'm hoping very much I'll find out why it's okay that I made all those mistakes in my proofs. Uh, but anyway, uh, the uh, speaker is Avi Vigdjesson and he will tell us about the value of errors in proofs. Uh, thanks, uh, Mark. Uh, glad to be here and justify everybody's errors in our <coughs> proofs. Yeah, you see my favorite proof system there is on the board. So I, uh, I think proofs are, are dear to everybody here in the, in the audience, to every mathematician. So I'm uh, going to tell you a story. Uh, oh, oh, I hope this works. All right. Uh, I want to tell you the, the value of errors in proofs and the impact, the amazing impact, uh, you know, introducing them, having lots of science and technology. Actually, I will not focus on this. I want to focus on some of the conceptual uh, contributions, especially, you know, paradoxical notions of uh, uh, proofs and uh, some consequences uh, this had on, on real mass and real theorems without errors. Uh, in particular, I was in, you know, prompted to give this talk by, by seeing this result that uh, many people asked me about. Uh, MIP star equals RE, I'll explain everything, uh, the right hand side on the first slide and the left hand side at the last slide. Uh, basically in yeah, uh, quantum type of proofs. But I thought if I have to tell you about errors in proofs, I better tell you first about errors in computation, at least briefly. If I have to do that, I have to tell you about just proofs and computation without errors, so I'll do that briefly. Uh, but at the end, and actually not the end, throughout the talk, I mean, one of my, uh, you know, it's a secret goal I have in every talk I give that's sort of popular. It, uh, really motivating the explaining the, the power of this computational complexity methodology that really drives this uh, sort of sequence uh, of events that I'll, I'll describe to you. Um, okay, so let me start. Also in computation, the history, you know, is just too long. Uh, so I'll give you just two points in history. Uh, one very old. Uh, Euclid's elements, uh, those who read it, you know, that there is, uh, you, know, you can look at it two ways. You can e either look at it as a collection of uh, theorems in geometry, plain geometry, deducible from five simple axioms. But at the same time, you look at the proofs, you see that they are all algorithms, constructions. They just tell you how to actually prove this by prove anything by constructing it just with a straight edge and compact. So, so these are you know, the two operations you are allowed. You construct point sets and that you know, gives you the proof of every theorem. So you see algorithms there, and its verification is plain to the eye. Uh, a more recent point in history is uh, just a century ago and uh, has to do with Hilbert's dream. He believed that Truth in mathematics is the same as probability in mathematics, which is saying that automating you know, algorithms for finding proofs. Uh, but as you all know, this uh, dream was shattered. First, it was shattered by Gödel, who showed that the first equation, equality, is wrong. And then by Turing, uh, showing the second one is wrong. And I will tell you about what Turing did, because it's sort of related to our story. Uh, to define the algorithm, so that's the starting point, the form, first formal definition of algorithms, really impressed the other, uh, had lots of consequences. Uh, I should remind you, he did it as a PhD student. So if you are postdocs, you may be over the hill uh, or aspire to this. Uh, one of the consequences uh, that we will not talk about is the computer revolution. And uh, the more conceptual one I want to talk about is proofs and computations here. So first of all, we are going to consider sets. A set for a set of numbers, set of sequences, uh, is really a decision problem. It's uh, encoding the question, you know, is a given X in the set or not? You can look for an algorithm for it, or you can look for a proof, maybe. 
very high throughput. And there are two sets you can consider, one for computation. This is set R, all sets computable in the sense by finite algorithms, algorithms with short. And RE is a set that are provable to finite algorithms, the finite algorithms can verify. And what Turing did is prove that these two sets are different. Here, computations and uh, algorithm, uh, computations and proofs are different. And the way he did it is just constructed a, a set, a set of halting tuning machines. And uh, you know, he proved it's in the right hand side, but not in the left. And the story today will be what happens when we restrict not to finite algorithms, which was a century ago, but to efficient algorithms, algorithms that run in polynomial time. So uh, P is a set of everything computable by efficient algorithms, and P is a set of uh, you know, sets uh, provable to efficient algorithms. As, as you all know, we don't know the answer. And while I'm insisting on efficient, yeah. What do you mean by computable by algorithms? By algorithms. You can enumerate, it means? No, no, no. I give you an X, and I ask you, is it in the set? Yes. You should solve it in polynomial time in the length of X. Mm -hmm. OK. Is it prime, for example? Yeah. Uh, I'll define more about the, yeah. The proof by algorithms is just, I give you an input, I ask whether it's in the set or not. OK. Uh, I just want to go on through a bunch of examples to make you familiar with what I mean by proof, because I want you to think about it very generally. Uh, and you can think in mathematics, but you can think about what proof means or what a convincing argument means in life. Uh, the, everywhere, the type of claims we are talking about are, you know, we have a set and we ask whether a given element is there. Can we compute it? Can we be convinced by someone? And maybe be convinced by someone is what I'm looking at. So convinced there will be two parties in this game. A verifier, that's uh, if you remember the movie, King Arthur, well, uh, it's sort of a bit dumb. Uh, anyways, think about it as a, yeah, maybe a referee, somebody that's eager to know and need to verify, but is sort of limited, maybe cannot reconstruct the proof. And uh, the provider of the proof is some all powerful entity, Merlin the magician, uh, who would give an argument. And of course, uh, you know, while infinite, uh, infinitely clever, nobody trusts him. I mean, you really need to verify it. So really, the point of view of a, ver uh, of a referee is really good for this uh, So I want to run examples of sets and uh, types of arguments for them. So arguments are just what the prover gives you. You want to make sure that it's convinced. Okay, here's the really, you know, just to make sure that you realize not only in math is uh, the encounter. I mean, you want to know which, which uh, uh, glass has a larger volume. I would say the type of claim is, you know, this is your X, a pair of glasses, and claim is that the left is, you know, you know has larger volume. So it's a very simple way to uh, check this, which I'm sure you all know that you. Like uh, if you fill the left with water and then pour it to the right and see whether it spills or not. But the point is you accept or reject according to you know, the, the outcome. And it's a very simple verification procedure, an algorithm. And it's general in the sense that it doesn't work just for these two classes, it works for you know, lots of pairs of glasses. that maybe, you know, one has to remember that the input has to be specified well. Maybe it has to have flat rim or something. But anyway, it's very general. And it's interesting to think of different ways of doing it. OK, that's just one example. It's a proof system. Uh, here's another one, more close to heart. I give you a large number. And the claim is that it is composite. OK, what kind of argument can convince you, for example, two numbers? whose product multiplies to the target. So that's a verification thing. It's very simple to do. Everybody knows how to multiply long 
numbers that you can write a program. Uh, unlike before, you know, this argument, before we didn't really have an argument, it was the same procedure for all inputs here. You know, this may be hard to come by, right? This kind of argument may be hard to come by. For proof systems, we don't care how hard it is to come by an argument. And here we really believe that it's a, uh, uh, it's really, okay. uh, it's hard, uh, well, we believe at least lot of cryptography has less So again, we have a general procedure, an algorithm that verifies the only thing we care about that it's very efficient. Anybody can verify such claims. What are the theorems of this proof system? They are just all the composite numbers. And I mentioned that uh, it's probably hard to come by an argument. You may think maybe there's a different type of proof system in which you don't have to reveal the factor. You can also imagine different claims, like instead of whether it's composite, whether it's prime, or whether it's prime, which has exactly two prime factors, and so on. Think about proof system problem. Let me give another example. Uh, Sudoku puzzles. What would be the claim? The claim is that this is solvable. What may be an argument? Somebody fills it with the number. And again, uh, there is a simple verification procedure. You know what it is, basically checking the rules of Sudoku are there. And it can be you know, correct or not. It's important to check everything that it's in. You know, the same set of numbers in rows, columns, and squares, and you also have to check that it's consistent with the input you are given, and so on. But it's easy, you know, it's a simple pattern matching. And uh, again, in general, it doesn't solve just this problem, it, you know, in, or just, it's not a finite set, right? I mean, you probably know, okay, the set of theorems here is uh, all possible solvable Sudoku puzzles, and there are larger ones. And you can think about uh, you know, uh, whether you can have a different procedure for that, or maybe you have a simple algorithm for this problem. I wonder in this audience, of the two problems, uh, factoring integers and uh, solving Sudoku puzzles, which do you think is harder? Who thinks that Sudoku is harder? Who thinks that factoring is harder? What does it mean harder? It yeah. takes more time. To, uh, to, to the so best algorithm in the world, to the best, to the best, to the best algorithm, not that's known, that can be. But do you want n dimensional? Yeah, yeah, n dimensional. Yeah, that's what I meant by this picture. Ah. Yeah, n dimensional, like n dimensional numbers, <laughs> <laughs> and with numbers and then uh, size and so forth. Who so bet that factoring is harder? Sorry, so and the best algorithm is the one which does it in the shortest time? Yes, let's say. Is it? Do we know that it exists? No, no, I mean, uh, okay. In practical life, what exists now? <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. No, no. <laughs> so what can you do better with computers? Um, maybe, uh, maybe I asked it in the wrong way. It just, you know, forget any formality. Do you think it's harder to uh, factor n bit integers or uh, to solve n size to the book? If, if you were, you, you had to do one and you really didn't want to do either, what would you do? Uh, factory <laughs> integers. All right. I mean, and, and, and so that was mean n by then, that, that yeah, was kind of scary. <laughs> it's pretty huge. All right. This is a question about it. Let me, uh, okay. Uh, that, that was an interesting discussion. Okay, we can come back to it. Uh, also, you know, I, uh, I mentioned already one formal proof system, deductive proof system, uh, you know, the plane geometry of Euclid, and there are many, like piano arithmetic, <laughs> is uh, one where, uh, you know, arguments are different. Here you have axioms and deduction rules, and if you want an argument for some claim, some formula C, uh, over, the, over the integers, then you just write down, I mean, it's a paper, right? You write down a sequence of lemmas, maybe A1, A2, or 2 a and each one you check whether it's an axiom or it follows from previous uh, uh, statements by deduction. And uh, again, also here verification is easy. I want to hammer this point. Verification in any proof system has to be easy. It doesn't matter how hard it is to come up with it. 
uh, verification is easy. And also here we have a set of theorems. I know that there are infinitely many primes, the and so on. OK, so I want to just find what's common to all of them. And uh, of course, there are many other systems. What's common to all of them? So what's essential about everything uh, we've seen so far? Well, we have you know, the two basic properties. We want the true claims in any proof system. True claims should have proofs. False claims should not have proofs. And verification should be easy. OK, you can be able to tell them apart. And efficient, I mean efficient, you know, as I said before, and I repeat again, efficient means I allow you to run only polynomial time in the length of the claim. This is sort of the, also the pragmatic view. If, if a journal, you know, uh, you know, put a page bound of uh, you know, the length of the claim, uh, including a page bound for the length of the proof, uh, it doesn't let you publish papers more than 500 pages. If that's a thing I don't understand, too. Proof means not very long. Well, I mean, the verifier cannot read too yes. long proofs. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's right. Yeah. Okay, the journal will not accept it. Yeah. But we'll see. Yeah, so far, this is a, yeah, absolutely. The verifier from now and forever will have to be bounded in time mm -hmm. for linear in the length of claim. Yes. So I want to just summarize. So all the proof systems can be just summarized, uh, you know, using these principles in this uh, complexity theoretic framework, and they look like this. Um, a proof system is just an algorithm, this verifier that takes a claim, takes an argument, and you know, runs it. And completeness means that uh, if the claim is true. There must be some argument which convinces the verifier to accept. If the claim is, in this, this is the case where we are happy, right? The argument is a proof and the claim is a theorem. Uh, the other side is if the claim is false, then no matter what argument is provided, the verifier will reject. And we call T sub B for this verifier B set of theorems of the system. And when you view it like this, NP is nothing more, nothing less than the set of you know, sets TV for all possible verifiers. That's what NP is, and it contains sets like we've seen, you know, the solvable Sudoku puzzles of the numbers. And this class is bigger than the class P, things we can compute efficiently, which are not just those cases where <laughs> we don't look at our, we don't need our. Okay, so that's a classical proof system. So far, no errors. Uh, yeah. Normal proof systems are just the set, the class MP. And now we want to introduce errors uh, in proof, but before I do this, I have to tell you about errors in algorithms. So just one slide. Uh, I'm sure everybody's familiar with probabilistic algorithms. I'm just reviewing it quickly. Uh, where does it start from? From the axiom that you know nature provides us pure randomness. If we didn't really have randomness, it wouldn't be too useful. So we believe it somehow, and then uh, you know that uh, algorithms make use, make use of this and make random choices. So the contrast is the deterministic algorithm. For example, if you look at algorithm for function f, it must be always correct. A of x always f of x. What we demand of probabilistic algorithms is that they are correct most of the time. But for every x, right, the, the randomness just inflicts their choices. But for every x, the probability that they provide the right output is at least two thirds. OK, so at least you know, from, in every computation, you may get errors. But at least you know what the algorithm thinks if you could run all of the uh, possible choices of one. And the importance of this, so here we introduce errors in algorithms. And uh, that's so familiar that you know, take it for granted. Uh, really important point is that errors in algorithms can be reduced arbitrarily, right? I mean, you, you want, you, you're not happy with one third error, run it 10 times and take a majority vote, run it k times 
and you decrease the error probability to exponential k phi. That's a term of bound that's discussed. Um, okay, so what's the value of introducing error of the algorithm? Everybody knows this. We guess now. We can solve all <laughs> problems. It seems so, at least. Uh, some of you know that we believe, we have very strong reasons to believe that you don't get more problems to solve, but let's leave it aside. Anyway, uh, that's the value. And the value is clear. And the rationale, as I mentioned, you know, we sort of trust the axiom and our access of random numbers. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we tolerate, you know, we tolerate some uncertainty in life, might as well tolerate it. Computation. So that's the story with computation. What about proof? Well, we do, you know, we introduce errors in the same way. I mean, we introduce, after all, we define proof systems using an algorithm. So let the algorithm be probabilistic. We allow a probabilistic algorithm. And now, you know, the outcome is again a random uh, variable. So we demand that in the case that the claim is true, there is some argument that always convinces the verifier. And in the case our claim is false, we allow error, okay? Still, we want the algorithm to reject with high probability, but we allow some small error probability, which we can again decrease by repetition arbitrarily. So here, we introduce errors in proof. And I think that there's a major difference ecologically at least. So when Baba and Goldwasser and Kali Rakov introduced this, uh, this was within the framework of theoretical computer science. No mathematician, I think, felt threatened by this because they obviously talked about other issues that we'll uh, soon get into. Uh, they didn't suggest that uh, you know, mathematical papers should have errors in them. But somehow it looks like, you know, proofs are sort of sacred and putting errors in proofs look. Uh, yeah, more threatening, but anyway, we'll flow with it because it's so valuable in algorithms, and we'll see what happens now. Uh, at any rate, we can uh, define similarly the set of claims that are true in this system for V, for NV, and uh, define IP, like NP, uh, the set of theorems uh, proved by such a system. And I noted two things here. I, I probabilistic. I allowed, and you also have to allow interaction in this definition, which I'll explain in the next slide. So when I say I mean I'm interactive probabilistic proofs, yes, please. I'm an outsider, so this might be very stupid. Do you assign different, do you allow different error rate for false positive and for false negative? Uh, no. So. Uh, uh, you 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 fix your error bar. It can be it's up to you. Let's say one third error, and uh, well, oh, you can assign if you want, but it doesn't really matter because you can decrease errors to be be exponentially small and still have an efficient verification. So it doesn't really matter if you set it differently. The no, I'm really sorry. Cool. What I had in mind is imagine I don't want false positive, but I don't care very much about false negative or the other yeah. way around. Actually, it is, it is somewhat subtle. Uh, I, I, let me give you a general answer that's true in most cases. In almost all the different, there are many interactive proof systems and you'll see some. In most of them, you can always make the acceptance rate 100%, the, the case of uh, you know, positive claims, who claim accepting probability 100%. Even if you didn't have it, you can boost your proof system. So, so you never have, I never, I always confuse for positive, for negative. You can always make the probability of accepting true claims with good proof 100%. The only problem will always be uh, uh, what you cannot get rid of is error in being convinced falsely by wrong claim, the wrong argument, okay? Yeah? So, but but generally, you know, we'll just be interested in some gap between uh, acceptance and rejection uh, probability and uh, lightning probability. 
Okay, good. So let me explain to you more questions. Sorry. Uh, let me explain what I mean by interaction. So until now we had no interaction. So here is the contrast between the classical proofs, empty proofs, in which you you know you just get a paper to referee, you just have a written argument maybe supplied by the program. And IP in which uh, we said as before, we have the verifiable probabilistic and uh, except reject with uh, some tiny probability of error. But now we allow not just one directional interaction, but we allow the verifier to ask questions and get answers and ask more questions and get answers. And only after this interaction, which again has to run in polynomial time, uh, the verifier decides whether to accept or reject. So you might wonder whether this is reasonable or not. I mean, that was the original suggestion in both papers. Uh, and uh, it is, they argue, and I would argue too, that it's, it's very reasonable. In the sense, at least, that that's how we teach classes, right? I mean, that's how we teach math. Uh, that's how we interact with our colleagues. And, uh, you know, it seems reasonable as a proof system, right? It seems reasonable to allow in extension, in extending the uh, system. So this will be our uh, definition. This is uh, a uh, class of uh, statement sets that we are trying to understand, IP. And the first thing I want to tell you about, okay, so here's the, the slide. So but once this is on the floor, I mean, it looks like, you know, you may, uh, you know, may appreciate it or, I mean, if, especially if you haven't seen it or not. Uh, it was, uh, was proposed in two different contexts. Babai for some problems in group theory, he couldn't find NP proofs for, and Goldberg for Mikhail Yarko for cryptography, and uh, in which interaction anyway exists, so you, you wouldn't mind if uh, you, know, you use it to uh, argue uh, correctness of uh, some of your actions. And what evolved, I, I claim, is, is an amazing uh, sort of revolution. So I want to tell you some about it. Uh, I'm not going to tell you so much about the blue stuff. I mean, I want to tell you about some paradoxical examples. These are, they are old, and uh, I'm sure many or most know about it, but I just cannot be such a survey without mentioning them. But I really want to tell you how they uh, you know, sort of form a path to the quantum proof systems that I'm eventually going to talk about to explain, uh, because I find this sort of... Uh, Way they evolve really interesting. Uh, so these are the zero knowledge proofs, in which con you know, showing you as convincing proofs is not conveying information, but something that does not exist in normal proof system. And the PCP, publicly checkable proofs, in which convincing proofs don't need to be read. <laughs> so uh, yeah, those who haven't seen it are in for a treat. Otherwise, uh, other people may be bored. But as I said, the more interesting story for me is that, uh, you know, how they led one to the other and how everything led eventually to this um, quantum push system, this MIP stuff. Okay, so let me tell you about zero knowledge. Uh, I just wonder, I wish I could sample the audience, how many people have seen this really old, right, from the mid 80s. Uh, so, the main reason uh, Gorbachev and Mikhail Rakov introduced the, uh, the interactive proof was for this purpose. They, in cryptography, there is great need for one party being able to convince the other that it's doing the right thing without revealing information. Like, you want to prove that the RSA key you picked is, a, you know, uh, a product of two prime numbers. But you certainly don't want to tell what these two prime numbers are. So this kind of thing, can you prove it in zero knowledge? What does zero knowledge mean? Zero knowledge is normal interactive proof, plus the demand that whenever the verifier accepts, so if he accepts, you know, she accepted, you know, 
definitely believe the claim, but apart from that, they learn nothing absolutely that they didn't know. Oh, uh, if you think about the last time you convinced somebody without uh, giving them the information, you would think that this is pretty ridiculous. Uh, I know that it's, uh, you know, it's not trivial to define, but I will not define. The intuition captures the formal definition, vice versa, but I'm not going to define it. And so the question is, uh, can you do it at all? Is there anything non-trivial you can prove without giving information? And uh, one of my favorite stories for mathematicians about it is the following. I mean, if you want to think of applications not in cryptography. So this is uh, you know, the issue of copyright. So here you, see, you can think of a junior mathematician coming to the chairman uh, with the breaking news. So Dr. Alice said that she can prove the remark. And uh, you know, the chair who is the number theorist, let's say, yeah, is, is shocked and uh, wants to see the proof. And so they engage in the normal conversation of mathematicians. They sit for a few days on the board. And, and uh, yeah, then uh, you know, happy ending. So that's a normal story. I don't want to get anybody paranoid, but some stories in the history of um, mathematics went uh, in a little different way, right? I mean, uh, uh, Proust was stolen, or at least reportedly stolen. So how do you protect against this? Well, the answer is obvious if you have zero knowledge proofs. I mean, Alice would just prove that she knows how to prove the Riemann hypothesis without a <laughs> shred of evidence uh, of how it was done. But if you know, she did have a proof, then Bob would be convinced. So and you can generalize it to copyright in, in lots of settings. So I mean, maybe they should convince you that there is no such beast. But uh, actually, uh, shortly after this paper was written, we proved that every theorem can be proven this way. So more precisely, if you assume the basic assumption of cryptography, much weaker than assuming factoring it out, much weaker, just that one-way functions exist, then NP has, everything in NP has such proof. In other words, in layman words, every proof can be made into a zero knowledge proof. If you have one, if you have a normal proof, you can call it in zero knowledge. So this is the lots of, uh, yeah, maybe you want to stare at it for a moment. Everything uh, you know, can be convinced without giving information. Uh, these are lots of consequences that I will not talk about, theoretical and practical. Actually, practical, I just want to mention that. Yeah, sorry, the question. Can you say maybe a word about what is a one-way function? One-way function, so factoring is a good example in the sense that multiplication is a one-way function. One way means easy in one direction, hard in the other direction. Okay, but, but uh, factoring is an overkill for this. You can think of any process that you know is efficient, can you reverse it? For example, take a polynomial map uh, you know, from n variables to n outputs of degree two. Take a random one, right? It's very easy to compute degree two. Can you reverse it? Stuff like that, I mean, yeah. Can you unscramble, scramble that? Oh, my favorite. <laughs> yeah, so everybody believes they exist. Uh, so I want to say about practical applications that uh, whenever I gave talks on these things, uh, you know, 30 years ago, 20 years ago, I always said that nobody will implement any of this. So this protocol, this zero knowledge protocol is too complicated. But it turns out that today there are lots of uh, things that venture capitalists know what zero knowledge is and they uh, give millions of dollars to startups that are implemented. There are physical zero knowledge proofs, but what I want to talk about is uh, the way they led to a uh, new proof system. So let me tell you about this. So let me see how we are on time. Questions? Okay, so more proof system. So the Z 
zero knowledge uh, situation, as I said, was that we can prove anything in zero knowledge, assuming cryptography, and it's not a big deal to assume it because we everybody is using it anyway, or this assumption in their lives, uh, even stronger assumption. But still, you know, you want to know whether you can have zero knowledge without assumption. And actually, we know you can. So the answer is yes and no. We can prove you can't, and then we can prove you can. Okay, so how do you prove you can? You change the model. Okay, so the question is whether it's necessary or is there a conceivable model where it's not necessary to use cryptography is what led to the next step. We were thinking about it and came up with a different proof system in which you allow not one prover, but many provers. I'll talk mainly about two provers. Okay, so what do I mean? Just like the picture before, there is some claim. Elements is in the set. You have a verifier, you know, a probabilistic machine. And you have two provers who are interested in proving this claim to the verifier, and they are physically separated. Those who know the prisoner's dilemma, or those who know how police interrogates two suspects by putting them separately, and interrogating them uh, is, has the right model in mind. I mean, these people may have, you know, talked about everything in advance, but, you know, and they know they claim everything, but after that, they are separate, physically separate, and then, you know, we have an interactive proof. The verifier can ask each of the questions. They don't hear any of this convers the conversation with the other side. And then the verifier uh, decide whether to accept or reject and should do so, you know, with the same complete sound as guarantee. So it's another model. Excuse me, uh, prover one yes. and prover two. Yes. Are they in cahoots, or is that correct? They are in cahoots yeah. in advance. They, of course, they are in cahoots. They know the claim. Uh, I, know I'm just clarifying. They're not independent people who claim to prove the theorem. <laughs> Uh, no, we don't. Uh, the issue in this talk is not credit. <laughs> uh, no, is, so I'm I, I will clarify. I will clarify. Yeah. So the story is the, the following: uh, the verifier wants to uh, check whether this claim is true, and now instead of one guy interested in uh, convincing the verifier, there are two people or five people. They are in cahoots completely. They get together and they think, how do we convince this uh, guy? Okay? They plan the whole strategy in advance, but all this happened before he asked them any questions. Then they are put into separate locked rooms or whatever. They are just physically separated. It doesn't have maybe pleasure hotels, but different. And the, the verifier starts interrogating them. They, each one can hear only the conversation with the verifier, nothing about the other part. Okay, so they are physically separated before the verifier starts asking questions. It's clear, Peter? Absolutely, yeah, thank you. Uh, and we introduced it for this purpose. We were wondering whether in this setting one can prove claims in zero knowledge without assuming cryptography? And the answer is true. Yeah, you can do it. Here, somehow physical separation replaces this computational assumption, cryptographic assumption. And the funny thing is that this is all we were interested in. That was the sole reason we introduced a multi-party, um, yeah, multi-prover interactive proof. And for me personally, it's more or less uh, the time I left this wonderful area just when it was going to explore. So let me tell you what happened next. But the model I hope is clear, so that uh, we'll stick with this uh, model. That's how the, yeah, you can ask whether this model is reasonable. I can tell you a story. <laughs> uh, MIT and the Hebrew University, uh, who were there, well, the four authors resided, uh, insisted that we patent this against our against our better judgment and they pay whatever it costs to patent they envision that uh, you know having no cryptographic assumptions which you know, is great 
And he said, you know, you'll have, when you come to the um, uh, money machine, there'll be two slots for two, uh, you know, for two cards that you are presenting. And that, uh, these two things will be maybe separated by a lead uh, curtain or something. Anyway, yeah, it was patented. I don't believe anybody ever did anything. But, <laughs> but at least, Again, verification is efficient, so we can think it's, it's uh, maybe reasonable and it's only implemented by security forces. Okay, so that's roughly how the picture looked at the, around 1990. Uh, we had stronger and stronger push systems. I mean, each, can, each is at least as strong as the previous one. Uh, we knew some upper bounds, uh, you know, on the, you know, what is the you know, algorithmic difficulty of languages or sets is it, uh, it can uh, pull uh, polynomial space on the first, uh, non-deterministic exponential time on the second, you don't have to. I mean, there are, there are large classes, much, much above and deep. Uh, we even had some, you know, things that look like uh, they are not in P that you know, can be solved by interaction. But uh, generally people believe that, you know, because the verifier is efficient, you know, they are probably all very close to it. And then there were, you know, I should say a few months of statement. Uh, just gathering uh, understanding. And then, you know, this explosion happened. So let me tell you what this is. Uh, you know, somehow the power of each turned out to be as strong as it uh, could be imagined. And, uh, you know, you see lots of red acronyms, which we in, uh, in computer science love, names of classes, but these all have conceptual meaning, and uh, like the previous ones. And let me tell you about the meaning of uh, some of this briefly, because that's, again, not the main uh, point of the talk, but uh, it's important. Uh, the first result says that using just a single proof of interactive proofs, you can prove claims like, I can, I have a winning strategy for chess. Okay, this is something that requires alternation, right? For, you know, I move, so no matter what you do, I move, no matter. This kind of claims, I, I win as white in chess, in any size board, is something that can be proven in this, it's sort of amazing. I mean, if you think about it, it's pretty amazing. But uh, uh, let me go to the next one. Um, with two provers, you can prove things that we know are intractable. You know, with NP, we, we think it's, uh, we may think it, but we don't know it, right? I mean, NP is not intractable. NP, you know, uh, uh, well, at least we don't know that it's different than P, but non-deterministic exponential time or even exponential time, we know it's different than P. So, with, you know, two provers, you can prove things that look <laughs> like, you know, they shouldn't be able to talk to an efficient verifier. And in particular, one view of this result says that exponentially long, because arguments in non-deterministic exponential time are exponentially long, so somehow, this poor verifier cannot access exponentially long proof. Must be it's allowed to what you know to uh, randomize, or probably can randomly sound it. But that's all they can do. But somehow they can catch errors in there. And the, the sort of the limit of this was the PCP theorem, which says that uh, written proofs can be verified just from constant size snapshots. So I have a. Yeah, I'm doing okay. So I have a picture of this, of the last result. Uh, I just want to stress these theorems have no cryptography in them. Right? There is no cryptography of their theorem, this equality. So I want to tell you just a little bit about the PCP theorem before I move to the quantum stuff, just with pictures. Uh, so PCP theorems are not interactive, they are just back to written proofs. In a PCP, uh, what happens is the same verifier, prover, uh, you know, picture like in NP, only that the verifier can read, let's say, 20 bits of the whole argument, no matter how long it is. Okay. 
And I think how happy you would be if this type of restriction was placed on you as the referee of the paper. So here's, the, here's my favorite referee. So somehow you will, you will think, it, can something like this be valuable if uh, whether can you find a proof? Uh, can you, sorry, find an error if one exists in a very long paper? So my favorite picture here is replacing the players First, I serve the claim, let me replace by a serious claim. Uh, let me replace here the verifier by uh, you know, editor of the annals, the random editor of the annals is very critical. Uh, put me on the other side, put me on the other side. <laughs> <laughs> if I were really sorry with this PowerPoint, I would pull move you to the other side. <laughs> You tell uh, the important well, thing about you, Peter, is that you are exceptionally busy, so you have no time. <laughs> Avi, 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 you missed the point. He, he, he took the, the opportunity to announce something tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I have a zero knowledge proof. Yeah. Uh, well, okay, my imagination says that you are, I, I need a, a real magician there that, you know, uh, uh, we don't know what he's doing right now, so uh, probably <laughs> that's what he's doing. So, I mean, just you, you want to imagine that, let's say, Wiles is sending a paper to the Amal, which, uh, you know, like uh, after 10 years of work, you know, it's a mountain of books. But what Peter is allowed to do is just open a random one to a random page, Look there and say, yeah, it's all correct or it's a jump. Okay, so that's what PCP is up. And the PCP theorem says that everything provable can be proved in this way. Okay, every proof can be converted into a PCP. So it doesn't mean that the way uh, you know, Wise or anybody would have written the proof normally is a PCP. There may be one bug in one page that you'll never get. But on the other hand, having a proof, you can, you know, feed it to your laptop and it will produce another proof. And that proof will have this property that, you know, somehow it will smear bugs all over even though it cannot find them. So that's a... Uh, that's a PCP theorem. So what you, you gather, what you should gather from the story so far, I think, is that the introduction of interaction, interactive proofs, randomness, and interaction and error uh, gives rise to proof systems that have properties that certainly you cannot expect, and in fact, you can prove normal proof systems do not have. But that was just... Uh, you know, the introduction to what I really want to talk about, which is the uh, quantum proof systems and the, and the recent results. So, so far, uh, you know, we saw a sequence of, of proof systems and they were classical. And I mentioned some applications here. But anyway, let me not talk about it. I mean, it's the concept, even on just this theorem, uh, yeah, I could I could uh, easily summarize it by uh, this sort of complexity theory was uh, born with the big bang of empty completeness in the uh, early seventies, and this you know like twenty some years later, the PCP theorem was the next big thing in the history of computer science. It's amazing what kind of impact it had. Uh, Maybe the most important was in optimization, where it allowed us to prove harmless of confirmation results. But, but lots of other things, and including practical ones. But I want to go back to uh, the interactive uh, model. And I mentioned these two results, and it seems like we understand, yeah, we know exactly what is the power of this process. And the next step is introducing quantum. System. So that's another, uh, you know, so I think that uh, I'm, I'm very far from uh, practical applications. And I would say maybe most theorists uh, are far from practical applications, but we live in uh, the world of computer science and uh, uh, different uh, ideas and different models and different uh, practical considerations. 
uh, affect uh, the new models we create. And uh, one thing that actually came out of physics, naturally, of course, but not from physics, I should say, is the idea of using quantum phenomena in computation. Uh, this was suggested, well, again, <laughs> it seems to be there, like randomness, so why not use it? And that was a suggestion uh, sort of independently made by Manning uh, and uh, by Feynman. Uh, why not use the quantum phenomena in, uh, you know, in silicon? And uh, it took time for people to actually formalize these ideas. They were pretty vague at the time. And, uh, but, but by now, we, we have a you know, model like uh, P, like uh, BPP for randomized computation. We have BQP for efficient uh, quantum computation. It's so very you know, natural to define. Simply the gates are allowed to uh, do unitary operations and the machine holds superposition. You don't have to understand this. There is a model of quantum computation and just the introduction of it, uh, you know, set people thinking, well, what can it do? And nothing much happened, uh, you know, uh, until you know, people had some examples. And then Peter Shaw, again, there was a, an explosion. Well, Peter Shaw discovered that uh, the problems with base cryptography on factor and discrete logarithms at the time, which were the main ones, have a very fast and simple uh, quantum algorithm. And by then, uh, you know, so, there were frenzy attempts to develop a process technology, mainly build quantum computers, and billions were already invested. Amazing technology was developed. We still don't have quantum computers. Uh, best quantum computers currently factor maybe you know, 10 bit integers or maybe five, I don't know. Uh, certainly, there was a frenzy to develop new cryptographic techniques or assumptions that will withstand quantum computers once they arrive. People try to develop more algorithms for more problems. And I must say, we didn't have so much success there. We, we know a few more problems solved, though. So we don't know how much more powerful it is than uh, holistic uh, algorithms. Peter will probably say that uh, it's not harder at all because he believes factoring is easy anyway. And uh, what I want to talk about is the new models they created. So quantum computers may be of huge value. Quantum interactive proof is just, uh, you know, the way complexity theory operates. We just, we just define analogs with whatever uh, computational mode that uh, exists in algorithms. So why not define uh, quantum proof systems? So that's exactly what was done. So here are the quantum proof systems. And that's the last part of my talk, last 10 minutes. Uh, explaining what uh, quantum proof systems are. So uh, again, it's very easy to make this extension, right? You verify as an algorithm, you let it be a quantum algorithm. Okay. And what was first defined, uh, the analog of IP, it's called IP star. So it's really the same definition, only that the uh, verifier is now quantum. You, have, you send qubits instead of bits to the prover. And uh, uh, it didn't take much time. Well, it took, yeah. I think maybe it was faster. But anyway, um, people figured out it doesn't buy much relative to the classical IP. What you can do with it, and it, you can do with it at least what you can do with the uh, randomized interactive proof, but uh, it doesn't buy more. I should have added it equals IP. Right? IP star is IP. And uh, then, uh, Liv Hoyer Tonner Waters introduced many, uh, you know, many programs. Sorry, now is, is there a quantum P space that's different from P space? No. Now, P space is now not P space. Okay. And, uh, you know, again, the definition is simple, but this paper was absolutely you know, brilliant. I'll explain in a second why. But anyway, the introduction of this or the definition is, is, is important. Uh, 
and uh, people studied the power and uh, you know first the uh, Eton really proved that uh, yeah it contains non-deterministic exponents of time it, nothing is completely trivial there at all uh, but uh, then people said yeah but probably you know just the upper bound will soon, soon come and it was sort of a you know <laughs> where, uh, you know, a year ago, slightly more than a year ago, these people proved that actually it contains non-deterministic double exponential time. You see the two e. <laughs> so clearly bigger than the, MA, the classical MLP. And then it was really. Uh, Everybody was wondering how powerful it is. Nobody imagined that it's uh, you know, what, what came here. Uh, just a few months, maybe six months ago, this uh, uh, paper came out, MIT star equals Ari. So let me stress, I'll explain, uh, which is so controversial. But you remember, Ari was defined in the first, uh, in the first slide. These are things that contain uncomputable language, right? So not only it's much stronger than everything literally, it's just, you know, stronger than everything computable. So I want to say some things about this and give you, I want to, you know, in two slides, uh, in the, basically uh, from now, the last slide, I want to formally state this theorem. Okay, so. Uh, Another way of stating it is that halting, the halting problem is equal in power uh, approximating the value of a non-local gain, which I'll explain to you. And this, the, maybe the reason I'm giving a talk about this here is that uh, it's provided counter examples to lots of important conjectures in various areas. Quantum information theory to the Tilson problem, in uh, von Neumann algebra to the Kohn's embeddings problem, in group theory to the Kirchberg, whatever conjecture. Uh, if you ask me about them, I can explain one, I can state one, and I don't know much about it. But anyway. But the important thing about this uh, paper I mentioned that introduced MIP was it already made there made the connection to the EPR controversy that you will soon see, the bell inequalities, the entanglement, and the things that really are behind, sometimes clearly, sometimes not so clearly, behind these uh, other questions at the bottom. Okay, so what uh, is MIP stuff? Well, we have, you have MIP, right? Two prover system, like before. And in fact, an important result of Feige Loas uh, was that it uh, doesn't matter how many provers you have, you can always simulate them by two. And moreover, the interaction suffices that it's just one round. And this one round things we have studied and it, uh, it helps us. So let me put the one round systems in a better you know, picture. So, what is happening in a two uh, prove interactive uh, proof? So there is an interaction, and then the verifier decides whether to accept or reject. So, how does the verifier decide? There's some procedure, some algorithm, like we said, it's an algorithm. It takes into account the questions it asks, the answers it got, and decides yes or no. Right? Good and fine. And we want that if the claim was true, this value is one, the probability that it accepts is one, otherwise, it wants the half or to not this question, you can put other bound, two thirds, one third, some. Uh, anyway, so uh, there is a gap between good claims and bad claims. And, uh, you know, these sets of, you know, the questions and answers are from some sets, Q for the set of uh, questions, A for the set of answers. And we also need to specify a probability distribution for the verifier, you know, with what probabilities ask the questions. It may be correlated of the left and on the right. But usually, if you interrogate, interrogate criminals, you correlate the question, maybe to ask the same question. Um, and then that defines the game. That defines the game. The game 
uh, this is what I call a gang. And once you call, you know, you call this a gang, this one around you, you enter a new frame of mind that physicists like to play. Uh, you can define the value of the game is that, you know, what would the best strategy, so they are in cahoots, what would the best strategy lead them to, uh, you know, probability uh, of uh, the verifier accepting? That's all they want, the high probability. The fact that it's a pull system said we will not succeed with high probability if the false is correct, if the claim is false. Okay. So we can forget about the claim. The game defines everything. We can forget all these things. We are just left with the game. And, you know, basically what we want to know is what is the value of a game once given, how, how difficult it is to approximate it. We know it must be hard because two poor interactive post capture <laughs> on the exponential time. Anyway, we have this game and we are interested in its value, which is written there. It's a maximum probability that the provers by computing functions on the question is uncertain. Uh, uh, the verifier, then we just evaluate, see the probability that is accepted or not. And this is what's called the local game. Uh, it's local, obviously, because they are separated. It turns out that uh, even if you, you let them share some common random string, it will, it will not change the probability of acceptance. So we may allow this if we want. They can be probable. Now, what's the difference in a two-prover interactive proof where you allow quantum? Well, first of all, you have to let the verifier you know, run quantum algorithm. That's obvious. Now you let the two provers, they are not only in cahoots, they sit in, you know, uh, there's a joint quantum state on the Hilbert spaces they live in uh, that they can use. And that's what uh, we call entanglement. Those who've never seen it, it's hard to, under to explain what it is. It's not that, you know, mathematically it's really simple, but I'm not going to get into this. They are entangled from a quantum point of view. Uh, and now what happens next? I mean, uh, it's the same. You define the game in exactly the same way. The verifier, you know, samples questions, gets answers, and, uh, you know, then uh, decides, uh, you know, we look at the value. Uh, it's called non-local non because, you know, the uh, provers are entangled. And here's the value of the game in this case. Well, it's the same. It looks exactly the same as before, only that... Uh, what the provers can do when they determine an answer, of course, they don't hear the question to the other side. But even on their own, given their own question, in order to answer, they can measure this, you know, state, this quantum state. They can each measure, measure it. And then that gives them the answer. So the question is, you know, or the definition is, the value of the gain is the maximum probability they can convince the verifier in the best strategy they can choose allowing this measurement. So just to con contrast it with the previous one, you know, here the provers, the classical one, the provers can only use deterministic or probabilistic strategy. And it's clear that one is at least as big as the other, and the question is, is there again? And this question is, uh, you know, I'll give you an example of the most famous quantum game, the EPR game. Uh, you know, I should say this was born uh, here at the Institute in 1935. Einstein was here, Nathan Rosen was the postdoc, and uh, like many of you, maybe in the audience, and Podolsky was the visitor, I guess. Uh, and they thought out the following game in order to, I mean, the basic the paper was called something like Is Quantum Mechanics Complete? And, uh, you know, the spooky action and the picture can. Uh, Two things that are traveling away from each other, each at the speed of light, be communicating. And so many of you have seen this picture. This is really an a variant of the experiment that Bohm suggested. And then uh, people tried to formalize it. Bell, famous inequality. The game I'll, uh, I'll describe it is uh, CH uh, by, by the last paper. And it's very simple. You don't need to know any quantum mechanics for it at all. Here's the game. 
all I need to define is the questions and answers, right? So questions and answers are just these. The probability of picking a question to each is uniform. So basically, the verifier sends a random bit to each uh, prover. They answer with a random bit, A1, A2. And what the verifier checks, he accepts, if and only if, the exclusive row of the answers is the same as the conjunction of the question. In other words, if both questions were one, the uh, provers must answer uh, yeah, two bits whose parity is one. That's, uh, and uh, you may you <clears throat> may wonder, you know, what would provers do? Well, it depends if they are quantum or not. Okay, I remind you what the values are, but uh, you know. It's very easy to achieve three quarters of success. It's just, you know, that with probability, uh, uh, you know, there's a quarter probability that, uh, excuse me. Um, I guess you basically, A1 is zero and uh, A2 is one, succeeds with three quarters of probability. Uh, maybe not. Anyway, there's a very simple strategy of achieving three quarters, which I thought I remembered. And it's also really easy to prove that they, they, you cannot do that. And once you know what quantum probabilities are, or what, how do you do probability with L2 and with the uh, superposition, which is really simple mathematically, you see that you can do better. You get the cosine of pi over x, which is bigger than three quarters. So this was uh, actually this was verified around the 80s. Uh, people started experimenting to verify that quantum uh, you know, mechanics works. And then there were well not then since Einstein's uh, paper, uh, terrible arguments between him and Bo and uh, lots of other people. And I can tell you that until today, the interpretation of what this means is still ready. Probably the physicists here can tell you more. But I just want to use this example to say now we, we understand what the game, what the uh, value, what this quantum value of a non local game is, to just state what the mi star equal, uh, equal r is. So here we see. So, what does the word non local refer to? The fact that they, no, have, the a fact that they have a, the fact that they have a quantum search. With the answer productive uh, yeah, of the experiment, the, uh, you, you collide, uh, yeah, I don't know, two electrons, which uh, this emits two photons that are escaping to opposite directions at the speed of light. But since they were born together, they have the same spin. Whether the spin is up or down, it's probably half, but whatever it is. And then you measure them. And somehow, the people say, <laughs> yeah, even though they cannot communicate, I ah, have up. Yeah. yeah, okay, so the statement is the following. Uh, there's an efficient algorithm, which given a description of a Turing machine will spit out a game. And if the machine halts on the empty input, then the value of this game is one. If the machine runs forever, the value of the game is at most one half. Okay. So in other words, approximating the value, if you just, you know, if you have an algorithm to, you would think that at least a finite algorithm to approximate the value of a, of a non-local game, but uh, this result means that it's undecidable. Maybe to, to Pierre's uh, puzzled face, I didn't stress it when I defined these non-local games. One thing that it's not clear about the best prover strategy is, you know, they can pick the quantum state anywhere they like, like they pick, pick their strategy. There is no a priori from this result. You know, there is no a priori, and will never be a bound on the dimension of the Hilbert space they need to live in in order to increase their probability of power. That's really what's hiding those uh, totally non-obvious statements. Okay, that's it. Um, 
Let me end with the way I end all my talks. Anybody wants to read more and more complexity can either buy this really cool cover book or can uh, look at my website where you know it's free for everybody. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to open uh, uh, the, uh, the forum for questions, but I have to turn the uh, meeting over to Camino. So from, from this point, Camino will, will take over. Uh, open okay. to questions. Questions? Questions? Yeah, so is this proof that, uh, that you mentioned at the end, the MIP star equals RE, has that been checked? Yes. Yes, uh, by now it's been checked. It's been, uh, well, it was circulating for about a year. Uh, I cannot tell you that I uh, verified it, so, but uh, I should say more about this. Uh, the steps on the way that I mentioned, and many that I didn't mention, built up a lot of the technology to, uh, to prove this result. And it has to do with the quantum error correction it has to do with quantum compression. Uh, and uh, some of the, I mean, it's still, you know, it's a uh, hundred pages above what was known before. But uh, yeah, yeah, I, uh, I trust this completely. Yeah, let's check. Especially, I think, people interested in, the, in some of the consequences. So it's really, as I mentioned, the uh, uh, refutation of the Kron's embedding conjecture, and uh, uh, this is there is no explicit uh, construction here, you know, falsifying the Kron's embedding. It's implicit, but the falsification of the Tilson, well, he didn't make a conjecture. He asked a question. Uh, I can say roughly what the question is. No, that would be good. Uh, no. Yeah. The, the, the question, I'm very roughly, I mean, uh, you let, so I said that the two provers share a quantum state which they can measure, right? And you know, or many know in the audience, I'm not going to explain what quantum measurements are. So uh, the question is whether the operators or the projections they are uh, used, using to uh, measure commute with each other or not. Okay. Uh, so some question can be framed exactly in this setting. Uh, it asks whether uh, it limits you if you demand that the operators commute or not. Now, strangely enough, for all the examples known, like the bell inequalities, the examples I showed, so on, to get an advantage by quantum provers over classical provers, all you need is commuting operators. It's not clear where, yeah. so the, the belief, or I don't know belief, I mean, the question was whether it helps ever to use non-commuting operators. And this question is really at the heart of the other question. And the answer is, I mean, yeah, this, this theorem tells you there's no advantage or there is? There is an advantage, yes, yes. absolutely. Yeah, there is an advantage. Yeah. I, 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 have, I, I guess it's now very, very related to what you say, but is there a way to quantify how much, if there is anything more than entanglement that uh, differentiate between the, this MIT and MIT star? So is it only the entanglement that, that provides you with this yes. additional structure? Or is it something, for example, bell inequality so, so what you just said about bad inequality that you can break it with something that that is commuting. Uh, so maybe it means that there is something beyond entanglement that you can. There is nothing beyond. I mean, the difference in the model is only the entanglement but, as the ability of the of the provers to measure it. That's the only bad inequality is is nothing. I mean, nothing. I mean, it's, it's exercises in, you know, in exercise in uh, probability theory for undergrads. It's not, uh, you know, very important is proving that the maximum classical probability in the game I presented is three quarters. That's, that's one very important. 
I mean, he set it up in the framework of, you know, there could not be joint random variables as opposed to quantum states that would allow these particles to communicate. But it's, it's a mathematical statement of this nature. I mean, basically a triangle in quality. Okay. So that's not it. The existence of an entanglement is the only source of power to this problem. Yes. Does the dimension of the required Hilbert space depend on the size of the plane? No, I mean, that's exactly it, it, that what this proves is that, well, maybe the answer is yes, depending on how you meant it. There exist claims uh, with louder and louder, uh, yeah, in, where, where the optimal strategy demands louder and louder uh, Hilbert space dimension unbounded. You cannot tell the bound a priori from the length of the claim what will be the dimension of the best strategy. Just like when I give you a Turing machine which halts, there is no a priori bound on how many steps it will run before it halts. Okay? It's in the same sense. So you cannot infer a bound just from the length of the claim. So, for classical Computers, we require polynomiality in time. Of the very of the very five. Similarly, here we might require polynomiality in space. That is, we might impose impose bound on how how uh, the Hilbert space should grow depending on the size. Of, of course, and that's why it, that's that's how complexity classes arise. When you say that uh, you know you are allowed to run in exponential time, in double exponential time, then uh, of course these problems are solvable within this bound. If you say that the input space must be, if you a priori say, I allow you only uh, double exponential dimension in the size of the game, then of course it's decidable, and it's decidable, I guess, in double exponential time. Yeah, you can get bound if you demand in advance uh, a bound, but the point is, just like with the, with the undecidability of all things, if you don't have a bound, then, uh, you know, you cannot compute it. It's also striking because if you think about quantum algorithms, algorithms, not proof systems, right? We know that everything computable by a quantum algorithm can be computed in exponential time, no matter what, no matter what Hilbert space you, you a priori could have thought may be useful. You know, without being given this bound, you know that uh, in uh, exponential time you can solve it. So unlike computations, proofs, uh, you know, cannot, you know, cannot obtain such a bound just from the fact that proof exists. Despite yeah. the fact that the verifier can only you know, interact with this proof for polynomial. The statement you can make in the context of Gödel's theorem, rather than Turing, that is uh, dramatic in the way that you did for the Turing machine. Like, uh, the, okay, the undecidable statements in a system. Yeah. Uh, so what is this quantum thing going to say about it? Anything? I don't know. I mean, it's a different characterization of the undecidable languages. I mean, you know, uh, probably the Turing theorem implies Gödel's theorem in a simple way, right? Uh, but I don't see that, uh, you know, it, it gives you, uh, I mean, I think that what's relevant here is Turing's theorem that uh, <laughs> R e is different than R as opposed to, you know, yeah, you, yeah. Have a, you now have a different characterization of, uh, of R e. But what Turing proved was that R e is different than R, this implies also Gödel's theorem. Uh, but that's a separate argument, right? This is this diagonalization argument. Maybe you can now run an argument like this for uh, uh, for quantum proofs. I, I don't know. I mean, uh, I'm not sure what uh, what interesting it will uh, tell us. I'm just trying to divorce everything from co uh, speed of computation. Yeah. Well, there is no speed because it's either finite or not. Well, the whole thing is similar. You, you're saying that you can uh, give a probability of whether the thing will hold. 
No, I didn't talk about probabilities that uh, anything will hold. I just said uh, the question of halting is uh, given a Turing machine, whether it holds uh, on an empty input after a finite number of steps or not. There's no probability in the question. I mean, uh, there, 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 are, there was a discussion on the chart about the fact that uh, there was a gap in the loop that was discovered uh, some time ago. Yeah, there was the, yeah, the, the original first, uh, the, yeah, it was, the, I, it, it was not a gap in the sense of wires per month last year. <laughs> it didn't need another year of, uh, yeah, no, no. Yeah, there was, yeah, it, it's a long pull. Yeah. yeah, I mean, uh, you know, every, <laughs> let me say, I said, I believe it. I mean, I believe it like I believe any uh, any other, you know, well accepted mathematical theorem that exists, let's say. But that has been fixed, yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. No and problem. there was about a question about what the constant bending conjecture says. What, sorry? What the common and the constant bending conjecture says. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, it's, it's about, uh, yeah. Uh, Okay, let, let me tell you, it's about sister algebras. Uh, since I don't know uh, how to state it exactly, maybe it's clearly one. <laughs> uh, the, it turns out that the group theory question is also about uh, sister algebras. I mean, even though it does a group theory uh, statement, so maybe I can say this. I mean, it's, it has to do with the uh, product of uh, two free groups. Uh, S2 by S2. So, uh, and you ask whether, uh, you know, the, the uh, you know, you ask a question, is it uh, residually finite dimensional, which is something you can define. Actually, Alex is running a seminar the whole year on questions that are related to that. In fact, the people uh, related working on this. Uh, but it basically asks whether, uh, so it, you can look at the algebra of this uh, product of, of this group uh, and, uh, and ask about computing the, uh, uh, not the specs are known, but I guess the, uh, yeah, you're computing the norm of uh, an element in this, uh, in this algebra. This turns out that this computing a norm is an undecidable problem. And it, yeah, I guess people believe that it's equivalent to having it uh, right now. residually finite dimensional, whether you can compute it in a finite time or not. So the embedding conjecture, uh, I guess, is uh, is related to this in a way that I don't understand or cannot say. More questions in on the chat? Yeah, maybe. maybe. No, that was the last question on the chat. All right, anybody? Uh, is, is Alex there? Uh, Alex is there. Yeah. yeah. I'm real. So could you, could you say this again? What, what, uh, are you... he, wants, he wants a cons conjecture. Yeah, yeah. No, not ah. the cons conjecture, the, the, the one the group theory. Cons conjecture is uh, where they are. I didn't quite understand yeah, the class, class, what yeah. we were taking. Uh, so yeah. maybe you can extend the class better. Uh, to know if every uh, von Neumann algebra can be s approximately separated by finite dimension ones. Uh, can you uh, I, uh, uh, can you find almost homomorphisms into matrix algebra which separate the points of the algebra? And when we say almost, we mean that they are approximately homomorphism, not exact homomorphisms. And the answer is, uh, I mean, and it follows through a long line of uh, uh, equivalence, which were known before that the answer is no. In fact, in our seminar, we, we basically study similar question for groups. And this question does not answer <laughs> the group theoretical problem. And there will be a talk in two or three weeks if somebody will explain the differences between algebras and groups regarding this type of question. I mean, just to clarify that, 
this, the abstract C-star algebra versus the C-star algebra, which comes as the C-star algebra of a group. Right. But you can formulate the question on groups directly on groups, and you don't have to say anything about C-star algebras in order to, in the classical languages was asked whether every group is hyperlinear. And this is still open. And that group, uh, um, it's related to Gromov uh, Weiss' famous problem whether every group is sophic. And, and it's kind of interesting that uh, from a different line of, uh, of argument, it's related to this type of PCP questions that Avi mentioned from a completely different angle. So somehow everything is related here. I find it fascinating just that this, uh, you know, this proof system sketch of this <laughs> yeah. of it, uh, questions in algebra. And uh, it's not surprising that they capture something in quantum information theory, but the algebraic problems is uh, it's more surprising. Well, I must and, say, and not only I should say, and even that shocking just... for me that suddenly the answer came from uh, computation. I have not digested it yet. I mean, it's amazing. I, I, you know, even without understanding the proof, I understand part of it because they were already appeared in uh, previous uh, papers. The techniques have to do with the fact that you are uh, like the techniques in the previous, uh, I mentioned in previous proof system. They have to do with the fact that you are working with families of problems and you have complete sets in these families of problems. And you can make reductions between different families. I would say this was the same thing with the, just just the view uh, of games in physics, uh, non-local games in physics, that they considered various games and they were sort of sporadic, but there was no notion of a model in which you can reduce one game to another and amplify the gap in the success probability in the value of a game. Questions like this uh, are much more natural where, where you have a, a class, where you have a model in which you can have reductions and so on. And this plays a very important role also in this book, like in many, many other. No. More questions? Well, maybe uh, we can stop here. All right. All right. Thank you again.